going to welcome uh, David Robinson from Shorts, who um, very kindly uh, agreed to step in at the relatively uh, last moment. So thank you, David. Um, no problem. You've got 45 minutes. Um, okay. If I can finish on time, some people will be thinking that anybody can. <laughs> um, I, I'm conscious I've got the slides on my screen. So if you want to um, just tell me what you want to we will, we will go on. To we will go to a break after this. Um, okay. There's a little bit of flexibility there, but people have got a break after this. So. No, no pressure then. I'll, I, I'm standing between everyone and a lunch. So, uh... <laughs> no, it's not lunch. It's a 15 minute break. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And enough. Gordon stands between them and lunch. <laughs> Fair enough. That sounds better then. So yeah, in, in, in true Boris Johnson style, I'll just say next slide, please, whenever I need to move on. So um, yeah, so, thanks, Matt. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've been asked to uh, just come across and uh, talk about exit planning and tax, um, which which we're going to do uh, for the next forty-five minutes or so. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I'm not sure of the format, um, but we can we can go with questions if if need be. Um, so this is my standard thing. I think in the in the slide, slide pack, um, Matt's quite uh, quite. Um, uh, kindly giving me a promotion to partner. I'm not quite a partner, actually. I'm tax director at, at Shorts Accountants up in, uh, up in Sheffield. Uh, we've got an office in Chesterfield as well. So I'm a tax advisor and an accountant as well, Rare Beast. Uh, but I have worked for uh, national firms as well, including BDO and uh, RSM. And more importantly, I a lot of what I do is on transactional work. So uh, management buyouts, trade sales, EOTs, that kind of thing. Um, working with the corporate finance team. So that's a little bit of background about me. Um, uh, um, the next slide, please, Matt. Thank you. Um, so today, yeah, just gonna go through a, a few um, a few principles around uh, tax and exit planning. So everyone uh, always likes to know about bad relief or what used to be called entrepreneur's relief. So I'll talk about that for a little bit. Uh, uh, then got a couple of bits around what are the kind of things that business owners can do um, in the run up to sale, looking sort of two to three years out, uh, what, what we call grooming for sale, but then also what they can do shortly before the exit. Um, so that might be like, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months before an exit. Um, so look at those. And then we've got a few examples to bring it all to life uh, at the end. So next slide, please. Uh, I keep going. Yeah. So first off, we've got uh, bad relief or business asset disposal relief to give it its full title. Um, so this is just a, a reminder and a bit of a kind of update, really. Um, although it's um, March twenty was the last last real change. So uh, yeah, it used to be called entrepreneurs relief. You can't make it up. It's now called bad relief, business asset disposal relief, um, as of March last year. Uh, as a reminder, this is the 10% rate of capital gains tax for um, business disposals. Uh, I guess when we're talking here, it's more um, talking about shared disposals. Um, so it's 10% rate of tax rather than the full rate of capital gains tax applicable to a share sale, which is 20%. So it's half, half price. Um, the, the lifetime limit for the old entrepreneur's relief used to be 10 million pounds. But when when it was renamed, that was reduced, as your listeners are probably aware already, was reduced to a million pounds. Um, so, you know, 10, 10, 10 times decrease. Uh, and actually the, the benefit therefore was reduced from a million pounds worth of tax relief down to a hundred thousand. And I think that's an important point just to mention um, because it, it means that some of the other types of exits um, rather than a straight share sale um, can become a bit more, a bit more attractive. So just a reminder on the conditions, because you know everyone assumes that they're going to get this when they're selling their um, selling shares in their business, but, but they don't always. So for two years up to the up to the point of a sale, a shareholder must be an employee or an office holder. An office holder just means director or company secretary in general. Um, they must also have at least five percent of the shares in the business, and the company itself must be trading. And I think, um, you know, we always mention to our clients, you know, that the, the trading terminology uh, it generally, if you've got more than 20% of non uh, trading activities in your business, that can jeopardize the relief. So that's something to, uh, to look at and focus on to make sure you get, get the relief. Um, next slide, please, Matt, uh, that's, that's bad relief. Um, 
So now on to uh, grooming for sale. Um, this is sort of what we uh, kind of like look at look at in terms of what kind of business do to try and get itself ready to sell, but also to help build value and protect value. And we'll go through a few principles here. So we always say to you know, business owners that are looking to exit in the sort of two, three, well, there's no real time frame, but ideally two years beforehand, look at your business as a way of using ta in a way of using tax and tax planning to help build value. Um, obviously, you know, business owners hopefully got a, a valuable uh, valuable business that they're looking to sell, but they can actually make that even more valuable by doing a few different things. So one one might be to incentivize some key staff. Uh, so for example, you know businesses might give bonuses to to their staff, but actually you can use tax advantaged share option schemes such as the EMI scheme to give a promise of a share to a key employee um, at a later date and, and that can help those employees one participate in some value on exit if you want to give them a bit of tax efficient um, kind of uh, money when, when the exit happens but more importantly that that individual that has that option will be further incentivized more incentivized however you want to call it to grow the business, so hopefully the business is worth more when the exit that when the exit does come. So that can be a really really powerful way of um, building value for for exits. Um, the other one on there, which we put on there, is, is called claim reliefs. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, if if it's a business that's uh, within a company that's been sold, um, there are um, there are ways and means to claim R and D reliefs uh, for any kind of qualifying expenditure that's incurred in, in that business. And for every pound spent, it can actually be worth up to 26 pence um, in, in, in relief for that business. So if the more we claim, the more cash you've got in the business, the more cash you've got on exit, the more, the more valuable it is. You know, not, not, rock, not rocket science there really, but um, it's something that needs to be done. The other one is uh, capital allowances. So um, quite often, you know, we've, we, see, we see businesses that have bought a property, say in the past, didn't really think about capital allowances when they bought that property, um, but there's nothing to stop that business then, you know, going back and claiming some allowances as long as the as long as the conditions are met um, and depending on who they bought it from, uh, you know, we, we will suggest go back and, and make sure you've maximised your allowances um, in order to reduce your tax and increase your, your cash in the business. Um, and obviously, everyone will have heard of the super deduction that we bought in earlier this year for enhanced um, enhanced capital ounces for plant machinery so i think the message there is just make sure you can claim everything make sure you've claimed everything that you can do and, and you've reduced your corporation tax bill um, and therefore you've got more cash in the business before you you sell it uh, next slide please uh, so the next one we've got here is how to use tax to protect value uh, yeah, again not uh, not rocket science, but you know if you are um, selling your business as a, as a trade trade sale to a trade buyer or perhaps even a management buyout, um, you know, whoever is buying it will be doing some form of due diligence. And if there are any tax nasties in that business, um, that can lead to a price chip and all the deal falling over. So um, just simple things, straightforward things, make sure your tax returns are all filed on time, your, your payments are all pe uh, paid on time. Um, perhaps do a, a VAT health check, page word health check, just making sure everything is clean and tidy before, before someone comes and has a proper look around the business. Um, I guess the message is getting your house in order uh, before, before um, you kind of open the door uh, for someone to have a look at it. So yeah, make sure it's in, in the right place. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, yeah, this slide is about getting the business structure right. And um, generally, a seller of a, of a business, seller of shares, will want to sell shares um, rather than a trade and asset um, disposal because it's generally more tax efficient for the seller to sell their shares than a, than a trade and asset deal. But the buyer might not want to buy the business, the company, in its current format. For example, there might be some non-core trades in there or there might be some investment activities, you know, some stocks and shares, uh, or perhaps an investment property. 
some vehicles that are you know not not to do with the business um trying to think of an example you know we we, we do have a client uh, of ours where they've got um some some you know luxury uh, old car vintage cars yeah, it's an investment buyer's not going to want to buy those or, or perhaps the buyer won't pay full value for those so in the run-up to a an exit event we're always suggesting that um you know, business owners look at the structure and you know, move stuff out if 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 it's non if it's non-core and get the get the business ready so it is in a saleable condition um you can do that shortly before the um before the exit event but if you do it with plenty of time to spare then there's more op options available so for example um you know you can in some cases demerge non-core activities if you've got enough time um, and you can do that tax-free whereas if you need to sell like an investment property for example two weeks before uh, an exit event goes through there can be some adverse tax implications there your corporation tax in a company if, if that property stand in it again and uh, sdlt so if we've got enough time we can demerge um demerge assets or, or non-core trades uh, in a tax efficient manner uh, and that get that passes it all up ready for a sale but it can also help you to protect your business asset disposal relief um, so for example if a yeah, if a company has got you know trading business um, but it's also got some uh, non-trading investment activity that's more than 20 percent that could jeopardize the uh the conditions for bad relief so two years before a sale you might want to as business owners um you know extract some of those assets uh so we've got two years of, of a clean company for, for that relief to apply so um yeah, get the business structure right in the agreement for sale point. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, in the kind of the two to three year period before sale, um, we, we would also suggest that you, know, you can use tax planning to look at the shareholder structure um, to make sure that the right people own the shares before you, before you exit um, down the line. So yeah, again, um, looking at bad relief. Uh, so one of the common things that we see um, for clients is that you know, uh, someone might have shares, but they don't have 5%, or someone might have 5% of the shares, but they're not a director or a company secretary and they don't work for the business, you know, perhaps it's a spouse. So they're not gonna qualify for bad relief. So you know, two years before um, an exit event, we suggest, we suggest looking at um, the bad relief conditions, making sure that um, one, the people that have got the shares would qualify uh, for the relief, but also to see if there's anyone else that we can bring in to share ownership, for example, a spouse or a wider family member to set that two year clock ticking for, for that bad relief. Because it is worth, like we said, it's worth 100 grand for every million, um, sorry, for the first million uh, on a disposal. So if we can spread that around, more people, the more reliefs we get. Um, aligned to that, uh, you might want to think about transferring shares just to family members in order to pass you know, some value on, on, on a deal. So uh, scenarios you come across, um, you know, the shares might be, might be owned in a business by you know, sort of grand, grandparents, if you like, they set the business up, or, or a parent, um, but there's an adult uh, child that works in the business, um, don't have shares yet. But if an exit event's coming, one way to incentivize that, that family member might be to give them some shares and it also allows them to um, you know, benefit from, from the deal when that comes along and, and qualify for bad relief if, if, if possible. Um, one thing to just bear in mind though uh, for the listeners is uh, uh, when we are moving shares around, if that's between a spouse, uh, uh, then that's generally tax-free, but if it's to anybody else, then there can be chargeable disposals um, arising, which um, you, you can you can um, get around through things like gift relief, but it's just something to be mindful of that there's, there's a disposal event that we need to uh, plan around. Uh, thank you. So that's that's the stuff that's grooming for sale. We'll move on to things to look at shortly before an exit, um, and and what I mean by that is anything sort of anything two days before or or you know ideally a couple of months beforehand really so uh, at, at least so in no particular order yeah first thing we always look at is uh, extraction so most business owners uh, will have 
um, you know, generally a lowish salary and then top up dividends as a way to extract value from the businesses uh, and run up to a sale. It's always worth looking at the dividends that, that are drawn out. Can we, can we accelerate some if it's just in the start of a tax year? Or should we postpone dividends and actually just draw cash out of the business as a loan? And that loan can then, of course, be cleared on the um, on the subsequent disposal, allowing the business owner to perhaps uh, extract value at a lower tax rate than a dividend. So, so that's always that's always worth looking at. Um, pensions, uh, people love love to hate them or love to love them, depending on your views. Uh, we, uh, you know, something that's always worth looking at is if, if it is a business owner that is selling their shares in their only business. Um, they might, they might not as an individual have you know, the opportunity to make any further pension contributions um, from their business in future, they're selling it. So it might be the last chance to have a tax efficient uh, employer pension contribution from your, from your business before you sell. So it's always worth having a look um, there. And pensions can be really tax efficient ways of, of saving for retirement for obvious reasons. We get tax relief in the company for the, for the contribution. Um, and then obviously the individual is not taxed on that receipt until they draw down their pensions late, later on. Um, so it's a really tax efficient way of, uh, of doing that last, last thing. Um, wills and LPAs, uh, perhaps, you know, more on the mundane side uh, of, of what we do in terms of our clients don't really want to think about them, but they are really important, particularly if you're heading towards a share sale uh, you know, business exit, your circumstances as a business owner are changing. Uh, uh, so we would always recommend that if um, if business owners don't have a will or a lasting power of attorney in place, then they should look to put one in place and they should look to tweak them um, if, if necessary, based on the fact that um, there's going to be a deal to go through. Fourth one on there is trust planning. Um, something to consider, I think, for... Um, business owners that are selling shares in their company, um, if, if they've got ambitions and, and objectives to park cash uh, into a trust for the benefit of you know, family members or other beneficiaries, um, they are or they would be limited to their nil and eight bands uh, of, of 325 per spouse post, post deal if, if it was a cash contribution. But if we are um, selling shares in a trading company, there is, a, there is an angle to um, contribute, gift some shares into a trust pre-deal and for that trust to then benefit from some of the proceeds on the exit, which, which in some circumstances can allow more proceeds, more cash to go into trust um, that, than if we'd done it post-deal. So that's something that you know, business owners might want to think about um, if they are you know, perhaps concerned about um, give it, giving cash away post deal, but they want that protection of a trust and they want to give away con considerable amounts. So that's something to, uh, to look at. Uh, the fifth bullet point on here is about um, selling a subsidiary. So a lot of business owners that we talk to, they can get their heads around the bad relief um, or entrepreneurs relief as it used to be called. And they're very focused on wanting to sell the shares in their business and in their company or group to, to benefit from you know, this 10% rate of tax. However, um, what business owners sometimes don't uh, appreciate or haven't come across before is that there is a, a subsidiary um, exemption from corporation tax where if a group company is sold, so perhaps we've got a group holding company that's got a trading subsidiary. If we just sell the trading subsidiary, that um, can, in certain circumstances, qualify for a completely tax-free sale in, in, the, in the company. So there's no corporation tax. So rather than paying, um, rather than selling shares at shareholder level uh, as an individual and paying capital gains tax, if, this, if the scenario is right, we could sell a subsidiary completely tax-free, um, albeit the cash and the funds are within a corporate environment still, because it's still within that group environment. But that might be really helpful, for example, if that cash is going to be reinvested into the next venture. Um, so perhaps there's another trade that the, that the entrepreneur wants to, to develop, 
or perhaps you know, the, the cash isn't needed at the moment and the uh, the business owner is going to reinvest them in some stocks, you know, some stocks and shares or whatever. So, um, yeah, that can be a really powerful way of um, not paying any tax in the short term. You still need to take your money out of the corporate environment after that, um, but um, it can be a really powerful way of, of um, planning for the future. Uh, finally on there, just a bit of a throwaway comment, but whenever... Um, Whenever we're looking at an exit event, um, our, our clients and, and sellers always think that every single type of consideration is taxed the same, that they're not. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail now, but um, you know, there, is, there are different ways between how cash consideration is taxed compared to, for example, a loan note or, or a deferred consideration. So, yeah, I think the message there is... Um, consideration is not all the same for tax purposes. So that's something to, uh, to, to think about when you're heading towards an exit. Uh, yep, yeah, moving on. So here I've got a few, um, few points around different types of exit events, just to kind of flesh out some of those. Uh, and I've got a few examples at, at, at the end as we go along. So uh, conscious, don't want to you know, teach everyone to suck eggs and whatnot, but um, I'm just going to go through these different types of exits that, 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 that are available um, to a business owner that owns shares. So generally, we can have a trade sale. I think most people have um, normally heard of, of that. Uh, that involves, you know, another company or, or, or our buyer um, coming in to buy the entire, you know, entire business, the shares in the business, um, normally to incorporate it into a wider, a bigger, larger business. Um, those can be really good uh, if you get two or three um, bidders all bidding against each other. You can, you know, business owners can achieve real top value for, for trade, trade sales, but they're not always, um, those deals aren't always there to, to get away, if, if you like. Um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the business might not be, be saleable to, to trade. Which is when some of the other other things, um, other, other um, options on here come into play. So uh, the ne next one down is a management buyout. Um, again, familiar, well-trodden term. Uh, so if, for example, trade sale can't get away, or if there's a really strong management team in place already that would like to take that business on from the current owners, um, an MBO can be a really uh, really good way of exiting a business um not least because the sellers can actually in, in some circumstances retain retain a share of the business they're selling um can't can't keep control but they can you know they can they can keep um some some shares um uh, going for going forward they can be financed by bank debt you know as, as as people will be aware but they can also be just financed by existing cash in the business um, and also on deferred terms. So, yeah, I think for a management team, it can be, um, you know, a really powerful and a good way for them to take ownership of the business without putting a lot of their own money in, in into the deal. Yeah. Uh, they'll probably have to put a bit of money in the deal, but um, yeah, a lot of it can be deferred or, or bank financed, which is which is um, makes those deals you know good in terms of getting them away. Uh, yep, certain risks for the seller, though, of course, in deferring. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Um, and they might want to yeah, have securities and whatnot and, and stuff, all those, all those nice commercial things as usual. Um, so the third one down here is CPOS. So that's the uh, abbreviation for Company Purchase of Own Shares. Um, it, this can be a nice, simple way to exit exit uh, um, for a shareholder, generally there would have to be a minority or a, at least leave someone else in the business um, as a shareholder going forward. So it's not a complete complete exit for everybody. But if you have got you know, one person that just wants to exit, um, a company purchase of own shares can be a relatively straightforward way of doing that, albeit there are um, a, a, re a raft of conditions that need to be met for the seller to benefit from capital gains tax treatment. Yeah. And there's, there's loads we could talk about on that, but in, in, in effect, a couple of the main conditions are that the seller has to have held the shares for at least five years um, and, and, and the disposal needs to be for the benefit of that trade, the classic one being that the, um, the shareholders have fallen out. Mm. So. I think it, it can be a straightforward way to exit the business. 
um, for, for someone owning share, holding shares, but it's not right for everybody, but it's, it's something there to bear in mind. Uh, the fourth one on here before we move on to EOTs um, is what I call a family buyout, but there'll be lots of different terminologies for it. And effectively, what that, what that looks like is a management buyout, but the management team are the next generation of family members. Um, a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs, you know, pass, you know they, they might not want to sell to trade. They might want to sell to the management team because it's a family business. And, you know, we come across that quite a lot. Uh, so they, you know, business owners might think, well, I'm just going to pass my shares on to my, my son or daughter or, or grandson or daughter or family member, whoever it may be for free um and that and that and that's acceptable and you know we see that we see that uh, relatively often um and we can make that you know that can work in a, in a tax efficient way however there is an opportunity i think um when a family business is passed on to the next generation for the family members that are passing the business on to actually take some cash out um as long as they're you know giving up control and and uh, genuinely taking a back seat away from the business and genuinely passing it on to the next generation, you, you, you know, that, that kind of family buyout can take a form similar to an, an MBO uh, with bank finance or deferred consideration or whatever um, to allow some cash out, which, which can be at capital gains tax rates rather than uh, dividend rates. So, you know, more tax efficient than a, a dividend. Uh, finally on their EOTs, and we've got a couple of slides on, on, on those to come. Uh, if you want to move on to the next one, please, Matt. Um, EOTs, employee ownership trusts, are the flavour of the moment. Um, they're very in trend. I don't know if, if there's um, anything else been said today, but we, we, we're seeing a lot of these. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons uh, uh, for that, and we'll come on to those. So they have been around for you know seven, seven or so years. It's only really in the last couple of years where they've, they've really come to the fore and they've become really popular. And I think the main reason um, for that is the headline rate uh, or headline benefit from these deals, which is that there's effectively no corporation, sorry, no capital gains tax for a seller, um, which is obviously a lot better as a rate than the 20% main rate or the 10% bad relief uh, rate for the first £1 million. So there's a lot of focus on the fact that it's a tax free sale for a seller um, but it does need to be um, does need to be right for everybody uh, including the business and I think just to flesh this out what, what we're talking about here is on an EOT transaction um, you know a business owners that own shares would effectively give up or sell a controlling interest in that company to a trust that's set up for the benefit of the employees um, uh, so that that's where the employee benefit um, employee ownership trust kind of comes in um, genuinely how it works is that free cash in the business um, at the time of the deal is gifted or contributed up to the trust which then is then used to pay out the seller on day one and then any future um, uh, kind of proceeds are then paid from future profits that are generated by the, the trading business um, so I think again back to the point previously you know this uh a large, often a large deferred element to a, an EOT transaction. Um, we've not seen that much take up from um, banks or other finance institutions to, to fund these. That they do, they do do them, but I think a lot of the mainstream banks, in particular, um, just haven't quite got their heads around them yet. So that market, I think, will will change over the next twelve months or so, and hopefully there'll be more day one, you know, kind of like bank rolled by finance institutions but at the moment a lot of a lot of the, a lot of the consideration is on deferred terms but tax, tax free um, which is obviously very attractive uh, i think just to compare eots to bad relief so there's no minimum length of ownership or percentage required for a seller as long as long as the seller is selling at a time when an eot takes control of, of the of the trading business it can be a tax free sale um, which is great. What's in it for the employees? Um, well, they are taking you know indirect uh, benefit, well, indirect ownership, but beneficial ownership of the of, 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 of the of the trade of the business of the company. Um, but in reality, they're going to be benefiting from these tax-free bonuses at some point. 
of three thousand six hundred pounds every year. That's great. But what after that? Well, after after that, if there's some money left in the business, then that money's going to go somewhere uh, to the employees as, as bonuses, more likely than not. So, yeah, I think the argument is is that the employees feel more incentivized because they effectively, you know, they can see that the profits that the business make will ultimately benefit them in, in some shape or or form. Uh, just want to mention there about if you have got a senior management team that are aren't quite ready to do a full management buyout, but would be disincentivized if they were just lumped in with everybody else on an EOT. Um, you, you can you can uh, in those deals put, put EMI options in place uh, for for, the, for those guys to kind of feel a bit more incentivized than than otherwise. Um, but it's something definitely to be mind, mindful of. Uh, so, yeah, I think um, it's only the first sale to the OT that qualifies. So once it's more than 50% owned, no future ones will will qualify for the 0% rate of CGT. So uh, I think business owners that are selling to an EOT just need to be mindful of that. It's only the first bite of the cherry that will get the, um, the 0%. So um, that's something to be aware of. And I think the key point for us is, Yes, the 0% tax rate uh, effective is a very um, strong and good headline, but these type of deals aren't right for every business. Um, where we see it, that it is a good thing, generally is where it's a people-based people, people -based business, um, you know, where you know, the, the people are you know, need to be incentivized and need to be um, you know, around in order to, to make sure that business is there for the long term. Uh, but absolutely, the tax mustn't drive drive these transactions. If it's not, if an EOT owned business is not the right thing, then then we shouldn't be going down that route. I think. Uh, okay, next slide, please, Matt. Uh, good, war good warning. <laughs> so we've got a few conditions. I'm not going to spend much time on this, uh, but just to be aware. So the, the main conditions to qualify for the 0% sale to an EOT. So it has to be a trading company. Um, a bit like the bad relief conditions, which we, we talked about earlier. Um, the sale must result in the EOT having control. So it's got to have more than 50% of, of, the, of the shares, um, but that can obviously be managed. Um, but I think it's important to note that, you know, if, if you have got a, a seller, they can't be keeping 60%. It's just not going to work um, with, this, with this type of transaction. Um, all employees must benefit equally. Um, generally, uh, that's the headline, but you have got a bit of flexibility in terms of length of service, um, uh, pay and, and um, hours worked. Um, and then, yeah, there's a couple of other things on there, which I probably won't go through given the, the time as well. Uh, albeit the last one's important to just say that if, if the conditions aren't met for 12 months after the tax year in the disposal, the not percent tax rate can be clawed back, so it's so, so so these type of transactions are very tax efficient, but there are some um, hoops to jump through and some nasties that can catch businesses out. So it needs to be managed uh, at the time of the deal and for the next 18, 18 months after that. Really, uh, yeah, leave it there. Okay, um, next slide, please, Matt. So, uh, yeah, so we've just got a, a few examples to, to chat through to bring some of this stuff to life, uh, which, which I don't think will probably take us the nine minutes we've got left and we've got time for questions if need be. So first one I've got is a trade sale. Uh, so here we've got an owner who is selling all of their business, all of their shares in their business to um, a trade buyer. Um, so I think the point that I want to just bring out on this slide is that the seller has got an option because there's a holding company and there's a trading company in this scenario. So the, the seller could sell at the holding company level. The proceeds would come into them personally and they'll be paying capital gains tax. Uh, and hopefully they qualify for that one million pound bad relief um, lifetime allowance. Uh, but the, the point is that they would pay capital gains tax themselves. However, um, as an alternative, Holdco could actually sell Trader um, and yeah, providing um, that, that Trader, well, Holdco would need more than 10% of Trader, but in this scenario, it's all wholly owned. Um, 
Holdco could actually benefit from the substantial shareholding exemption. So all the proceeds would come into Holdco, but Holdco wouldn't pay any tax at all. So no corporation tax. So the full proceeds tax-free would be in Holdco. If the owner wanted to take those proceeds out as, a, as, you know, as cash, that would be a dividend or maybe could liquidate, but there'd be a tax charge on the extraction. So yeah, not, not, not ideal. However, if Holdco is then going to use that money to reinvest in a new venture um, or some stocks and shares, the compound growth in value can actually be much, much better than paying the capital gains tax and then, and then investing the proceeds personally. So I think the message is if in this scenario, if the owner was going to do something with the money afterwards um, and didn't need it per and it'd be in a business sense, but didn't need it personally, then selling at subsidiary level um, could be something to look at. Um, particularly David, this is something we we touched on yesterday. The use okay. of sort of private investment companies. Yeah. Um, and in my experience, you get into a transaction, and the, the vendor focuses on the transaction. But actually, yeah. as an advisor, that conversation about well, I know you perhaps don't want to think about it now. Yeah. But you should. What are you? What What might you do next? What might yeah. you want to do with the money? And then say we looked briefly yesterday at some of the savings that can be. Uh, achieved using yeah. private investment companies and using the, the roll up within them yeah that, that conversation at this stage of it like you say to flag up well you could sell most people say oh we'll just sell the whole thing and then i'll worry yeah. about it later but actually those are the kind of conversations to be having with clients before it's too late <laughs> absolutely yeah because the buyer is going to have to know what they're buying yeah first and for you know first and foremost but um uh i, th I think you're right i think it's it's more important now or perhaps it's more on people's radars now, I should say, um, now that the entrepreneur's relief, bad relief limit is no longer 10 million. When it was 10 million, I think everyone was focused on that. I just want to bank my 10% yeah. and, and then I'll go again. But even then, I think it was still, you know, it was still worth considering because the compound effect of investing 100% rather than 90 over a long period of time is really powerful. Um, but now the rates are for, for bad relief, you know, are, so poor a million quid um it, it's more important than ever and we've definitely done deals recently where they've sold trader in this scenario because they're going to use the whole co as a family investment company or a personal investment company like you said um or, or perhaps they you know you're going to go again and invest in new venture so yeah i think it's an um, important point that sellers don't always don't always take um take on board so anyway yeah good uh next one MBO family buyout. Just to bring this to life, see, so we've got the the owner manager on the left with his trading business, trading um, trading company. Uh, this could equally be a management buyout or a family buyout, but uh, I think we, we, we'll, we'll go with the MBO one for now. So, yeah, owner owner manager would sell um, to a new company, and that's generally how these MBOs would be set up. Uh, owner manager can keep some shares. Uh, and they might roll those over into the new co. Um, they can't keep control. And the reason why they can't keep control is if they did keep control, more likely than not, the well, certainly the transaction securities rules would, would likely uh, bite uh, and the consideration payable to the manager could be taxed as a dividend rather than rather than capital. Um, so so you need to be wary of, of that. Uh, and yeah, like it says on here, bank bank could put some finance into Newco to back the management team, uh, and, and but sometimes as well we have loan notes or deferred consideration uh, that's payable out to the owner manager over time. So that one I think is pretty straightforward and well trodden. And then the last slide I think for me, uh, with four minutes to spare, is on EOTs. Um, yeah, we, we spent a bit of time that we on EOT, so I won't go through this uh, for too long. But um, yeah, in this scenario, we've got the same thing. We've got an owner manager that owns 100% of the trading business. Uh, generally, what generally we've seen um, most of the OT transactions we've worked on have resulted in the owner manager selling all of their shares, and that's what this this example um, shows as well. So all of the shares sold to an EOT. The EOT set up for the benefit of the employees of the trader. Um, cash in the trader is gifted up to the EOT uh, uh, to pay out on day one. And then future profits are paid up from the trader to the EOT to pay out on the deferred terms. 
um, as we as we go along. I think that the, the point I wanted to mention here that I didn't on the other slide was that the tax free bonus is three thousand six hundred quid a year. That's great for the employees, but generally, um, the ones that we've worked on, there's a you know that there's some covenants in in the in the sale agreements and whatnot where those bonuses won't be paid out until the deferred uh, deferred consideration has been paid off in full because um, it's only fair that the seller would get their deferred in in full before you know the the benefit starts to accrue i think for the um for the employees um down the line so that's that's one thing that we can do to protect that deferred in a bit more a bit more detail so i think i think that's my last slide matt if i go back so yeah my my kind of key points really on an exit event hopefully it's been been a useful um 40 minutes or so but i think the key messages for me are yeah, plan early. Yeah, we 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 do a lot of transactions um, with our, uh, you know, on, on the CF side. Uh, but in terms of tax planning, it's always better to have more time than not uh, to get your business ready, to get your shareholder structure ready, to um, you know make sure everything's ready to go on an exit event. Um, so definitely plan early. Uh, business owners shouldn't assume they'll get bad relief. Um, it's worth reviewing it two years in advance, making sure we spread shares around your know, family members and whatnot to maximize that relief. Um, consider an EOT sale. I would say that's flavor of the month, isn't it? Um, but in certain circumstances, they can work really well, really powerful. And in the uh, in a general sense of the word, they are friendly deals. Um, you haven't got a, a nasty trade buyer that's crawling over everything. And, and generally, if, if we want the deal to go through, it will do, as long as the value is right. Um, we've got independent valuations that back it up or whatnot. So, um, David, am I right in thinking that I saw the CIOT take a bit of interest in that? Obviously, the uh, zero rate tax had been attractive to some who maybe weren't using it the way it was intended. Yeah, uh, not least the writer of that article. Um, which was <laughs> ironic, yes, <laughs> Mr. Miller. <laughs> All right, okay. Yeah, I think I think um, I, I think it will be inevitable that these EOT transactions become um, scrutinised uh, down the line because yeah. you know there are um, for the reasons we explained before. You know, there there are a lot of companies that are pushing this as a as a solution to get. Yeah. You you know, you get your, get your money out tax free. And I think there are, you know, certain firms that are pushing it as a way of saying, well, we'll, we'll just get you 20 years worth of profits out tax, tax free. Nothing really will change, but you will get all the profits out of the business for the next 20 years and you've never paid any tax on it. That can't be right. Um, you know, if, if a valuation, if, if it's a market value deal, but you're taking 20 years to pay off the deferred, that can't be a market value deal. Um, you know, it, yeah. it, that, that, the multiples don't don't work. So, I think the more that these things are used, it will become more and more and more under scrutiny. And um, you know, like I said before, they need to be done for the right reasons. It needs to be right for the business. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the the starting point to go through with an EOT. It can't be tax. It can't be tax driven, albeit tax is very the tax rate is very attractive. It needs to be right for the business. And I think that the fact that um, the deferred consideration is paid over time and generally can't, can't be secured on the shares of the trader means that the business owner, need, they need to be comfortable that it's right for the, the business because they're, they're ultimately going to be owed money from it. Yeah. They need to make sure it's successful in the future. So I, th I think it is it should be kind of self-fulfilling and it all... It should be done for the right reasons, but there are there are ones push, pushing it out there that aren't aren't for the right reasons. Um, and whether the rate whether the rates go whether it's a ten percent rate or um, you know instead of instead of an effective nil, who knows? But I think I think eventually they will start they will start to change the rules on it a little bit, tighten it up. As ever with these things, I think yeah. um, the way the market develops will draw HMRC's attention. Yeah. Um, the, Pete Miller, who, who was the CIOT commentator that sort of sort of flagged this up. He was the very first person that ever said employee ownership trust to me several years ago. And I think he's probably been, a, uh, my guess is he was an early optimist, uh, he's been doing it properly, but as ever, 
and we've seen it you know there's, there's people still flogging loan schemes for example there's yeah. always a proportion of the market yeah. albeit hopefully very small that will try and um push things way too far um, yeah. and will probably perhaps spoil it for everybody <laughs> else um and just one final point because i know people do a break before gordon takes us through a wellness session at one um, and it was something you touched on uh david and it was based partly on my big firm experience many years ago as a small firm and most of our members are small firms you have the benefit of agility and the fact that you actually should you know what's going on with your clients that is an attribute to use to your advantage in these situations bigger firms and you know i worked in two top 10 firms the tax guys were often the last people to know that there was a deal in the offing you know, it might be the audit partner that you, and then he's got his corporate finance colleagues in, and then everybody. And by the time tax gets wheeled out, it's frankly too late to do a lot of the things that we've yeah. just heard about. Yeah. In small firms, you have that advantage. You know, don't be afraid to use that. And actually, you know, you, you might often find yourself, you know, you know, particularly your better clients, your bigger clients who, you know, bigger firms will be sniffing around, particularly around a transaction. You know, it might be too late by the time they their tax guys get told about it. Yeah, that's a classic agree. failing in big firms. Um, yeah. Certainly was in my experience in two of them. Um, the fact that you say so you've got that knowledge, you know the clients intimately, um, you can start those conversations around what are they planning to do next. We said you know hold co versus selling the sub. Yeah, we talked earlier about the confidence to have those conversations at whatever level, level of the organisation. Bigger firms are really bad at picking up things like that because by the time someone who knows about it gets to find out about it, Too they've late. probably had three months of due diligence being done. The private equity house yeah. thinks they're buying the, the top co. Yeah. And, and then you say, well, why haven't you thought about selling the sub? And they go, oh, you can't mention that now. You'll bugger the whole deal up. Yeah. I, yeah, I completely agree with, with all of that, uh, including the, big, the, bigger, the bigger firm experience. And I, I think, yeah, the key message really is for everybody that um, you know, can have that conversation uh because we know our, our clients it's the earlier the better isn't it really the earlier we can talk about all of these things the, the better because there's just more time to plan there's more time to implement planning um for example you know, the two-year bad relief and, and whatever um so yeah look luckily um yeah we're, we're yeah we're, we're, we're well versed at uh, having these conversations well in advance and that's what i think the key, key message really is really get tax last point on here get tax advice get it early that's what we always say to our clients. Very good, very Thank you good. very much, David. Um, Gordon, you've got a 10-minute break now for people, if that's okay. Um, yes, back at yeah. one o'clock. We've got one session left. I'm going to speak to people about taking care of well-being for themselves and those around them and why it makes good business sense. Um, and Gordon, hopefully... Gordon, can I um, ask David a question, unless he's already sure. gone? I'm no. still here, yeah. Uh, David, uh, hopefully a straightforward question. Um, it's to do with uh, BAD uh, relief. Um, if you a company sells the business, i.e. not the shares, and the payment is done over a three-year period, so you can't really wind up the business until, so say, three or four years after the date of they've ceased trading, still got mm -hmm. the same directors or whatever, then you wind it up. Does BAD apply or is it sort of lost in time? So, so um, when, once a business has ceased to trade, so once a company mm -hmm. has ceased to trade, mm -hmm. there's effectively a three-year window to, 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 to liquidate, liquidate and claim okay. bad relief. So I think if you're saying three to four... No, um, I, I was guessing, <laughs> but now you now you specified three. It will be done within three. <laughs> if you say three, then I think you're yeah. okay. Um, All right. Is three is sorry is three years defined in legislation then? Yeah, yes. Yes. Fine. I thought I thought there was something along those lines because it couldn't uh, it could not apply because of a certain transaction, but I thought there might be a time limit. Yeah, you I mean, I really don't want a deferred consideration payable on the third anniversary of the date of the transaction, for example, because you typically you're three years and you can't wind it up in time, or you've right. got a very fraught day. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Thank you, thank you, David. Yeah, yeah. No interrupt. That's could I also quickly ask David a question? Mm -hmm. Julian, yeah. Julian. Yep. Um, quickly going back to the the OTs. Yeah, and um, the company making about market value and deferred consideration. Um, I'm assuming from that, 
Um, but, but what you're basically saying is that the length of the time over which the deferred consideration will be paid, uh, that potentially is going to affect, um, if you like, how robust the argument is that the sales at market value. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, exactly. It is deferred um, as long as the time period is okay. It'll all be tax free at, at the point of the transaction. Yes. So, as quickly yeah. can I ask, I'm yeah. almost linked to, to the question that was just asked. I know how long is a piece of string, but say, for example, you had a £10 million deal, 50% of it was deferred. What is a reasonable period to defer it over? Would yeah, three okay. be the top end or could it be over longer? So, so right, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, and I think, so, so, so our starting point on any EOT transaction is always a, is always an evaluation. Um, and then we get that independently verified. That's not, the legislation doesn't, doesn't stipulate that, but we get that independently verified so that we've got two, two valuations that say, this, hopefully say the same number. Um, and that's based on your know, normal principles of, you know, um, multiple earnings or whatever. Um, how you get to pay that actual valuation out, um, obviously free cash on day one, but that's going to be on top of your earnings valuation, right? Um, so the, the, the actual earnings valuation will be paid under deferred terms. So I think the argument goes is that if we're saying, right, we've got a multiple of, I don't know, say seven, seven four, four, four is the normal one for us, I think. So four, four, four times EBITDA um, gets your valuation. But then for whatever reason, the cash flow in the business isn't enough to support the payments of, of that deferred over um, four years. If it's eight years, that'd be okay. If it's 10 years, oh, probably okay. If it's 12, 13, 14, because the business just can't afford it cash-wise, because cash ha actually has to be physically paid up as a contribution out of profits uh, over, over to the to the sellers, you're starting to get in sticky ground. And I have seen articles on this um, uh, in, you know, recently, the last six months, where I think they quoted, I think they quoted 12 years as being like a that's starting to get a bit. A bit sticky, um, but there's no, there's nothing in the legislation that says eight years is fine, twelve years isn't. It'll just come down to what what is a robust valuation for for that particular business. Um, but for us, in, in in you know in what we're doing in our, our deals, we feel uncomfortable if there's anything over ten years, and when we're having to have a um, proper conversation with clients as to why 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 the valuation is taking ten years to to pay off. Um, and we haven't done any that have been over 10 years. I think the most we've done has been eight. Um, but all of our deals have got um, uh, flexibility built into the sale and purchase agreement where the actual deferred is meant to be paid off over eight. But if everybody agrees, because I don't know, there's a trading, there's a trading uh, reason why we need a bit more cash in 2025. If everyone agrees, they can have a you know, lower payment in that year. So, you know, if, Flexibility is, I think, brought, um, included in all the all the ones we've done. So there might be some deals that we start off as a six-year deferred that might turn into eight or nine by the time we get there. Um, that's not to say that that wasn't a market valuation. It's just reasons why it's taken a bit longer. So I, I think, yeah, to, to kind of dodge the question, there's not a specific line, I don't think. And if anyone's got any thoughts on that, I'd be interested to hear, to hear them. But we're generally going anything more than 10 we're not comfortable with. Right. So, so you're basically saying um, there'll be a valuation, uh, there'll be an earnings element to that within the valuation. The earnings element is, in effect, the deferred consideration. Yeah. The period of time over which the deferred consideration will be paid will be dictated more upon commercial um, reasons as to what the business can afford and still enable it to trade properly, etc., without putting it at undue risk or undue pressure. Yeah. And as long as that appears to be a sensible period of time based upon forecasts and whatever the financial information was available at the time and is reviewed ongoing, that ought to be acceptable. I, th I, think, I think that's right. It's no different from a, you know, a, a management buyout that it really is it. How much would a bank put in, get, given you know, the forecast and how much the business can afford? Um, yeah, that's kind of what the seller's doing on the EOT, on the EOT, EOT transaction, aren't they? They're having their deferred consideration every period of time. What's a reasonable period of time? They want it. It's a commercial, it's slightly commercial, um, is a friendly deal, but there's a commercial um, push and pull there, isn't there? The, the sellers want the deferred as quickly as possible, but the business wants it when it's affordable. So 
um, yeah, as long as as long as there are specific, like you know reasons why um, it is what it is and they're robust, I think we feel comfortable. But yeah, we haven't done any over eight, and yeah, I think given what we've read read around the topic, yeah, anything over ten we feel uncomfortable with. I think just for, for call the great skeptic in me these days. Um, I think Julian, it's one of those things. I think you'd expect to see in the first in the tribunals at some point in the future. Yeah. HMRC will clearly try and pick a case where the valuation doesn't and the cash flow just doesn't, it doesn't support what's been paid, and they will then try and use that as oh, well, you know, this this decision says that you know yeah. eight, eight, ten years is too long or twenty years is too long or whatever the figure is, and they'll run around and then look at everything short longer than that and think they can have a go. Oh. You know, it's going to depend on the sector as well, because some sectors have, you know, you benchmark it and say it's got a ridiculous PE, you know, pharmaceuticals, mm. 16, 20, whatever it is. If you look mm. at listed multiples, pharmaceutical businesses eat cash generally to start, yeah. you know, not pay it out. So you might, if it was that kind of sector, it might look really odd. But if you've got a, a business that generates a huge amount of cash, but actually maybe the trade, the underlying trade's uncertain, you know, so... I, for, for me i don't i think it's all around can you you've got to get the valuation right at the beginning yeah and then look at the, the fundamentals of what the business can afford and do the two fit together yeah because they might not you know i can say i can quite see a you know a pharmaceutical business for example being quite hard to do in an eot but the kind of thing you'd probably walk into a pe house or a you know VC, you are quite keen on these kind of things because they're fashionable and you keep layering them up and then fall all over it. So horses for courses, I suspect. Yeah, I agree I suppose with there's that. a worry here of excess valuations as well. Some people people will push this, definitely. Absolutely. Some people will. Yeah. And, and that's why you know we we suggest to all our clients get two valuations. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that it's it's foolproof, but two is better than one. Um, and we can evidence that we've, we've got that. So I think that's that's worth bearing in mind. Thank you very much, David. I'm very conscious. I think Gordon's managed to sneak out for a brief break uh, <laughs> and is back to take us through his uh, wellness session. Are yeah. you uh, all geared up? So thank you very much, David. That's really yeah. good of you. Uh, really appreciate there. your time. I'll, yeah, I'll, brilliant. I'll, I'll off there. All right. Yeah, Cheers. perfect. Thank you.